and so you could join us. So yeah, welcome everybody and uh, everybody who stands for Standing Rock. Uh, my name is Chihiro and I come from uh, Dutch ancestors on my mother's side and Bolivian Quechua ancestors on my father's side. And when I went to Bolivia in 2010 to make a movie about an ongoing struggle for recognition for rights for Mother Earth, I also met with Bolivian uh, water protectors who fought during the water war revolution in 2000. So I think uh, to start this meeting, it's important to know that the struggle was not a beginning, but it, it was a, a, a revitalization of a long-lasting, um, accelerating, um, pressing struggle around the world for water safety and, uh, well, quite basically for life. So I'm honored to speak tonight on a few lessons we may learn from the indigenous fight, um, the fight back for water, for life, and for justice. We're gonna talk about four challenges and four lessons. And, uh, yeah, so a few days ago, we, uh, we celebrated on Sunday. Uh, I don't know if you all have been following this for a long time or if people have just kind of come on board, but on Sunday, we had great news that actually um, the final easement uh, was denied. Uh, Lake Oahe was the, the, the part where um, even though this long pipeline had already almost been finished in construction, um, there was no permission to go ahead. So the Army Corps denied the final easement uh, to finish the Black Snake. This victory is not the end of the struggle, however, and like I said, nor was Standing Rock the beginning of the fight back. Um, but both have great signification, and I'm happy to dive into some core lessons we may learn in the Netherlands from the Lakota Nation. So just to level expectations, I'm gonna briefly point out what I aim to discuss in this introduction. Um, I couldn't fit everything into uh, this talk, so I hope that with the discussion, more stuff will come up because, well, if you open this can, there's just so much. So first, a little overview of the players and the playing field of the struggle um, for the past few years, and then I'll dive into some historical uh, lessons, some hard-learned lessons um, from surviving settler colonization. And finally, I would love to go into some uh, reflection on ongoing uh, solidarity work in the, uh, the Netherlands, CNL. So, uh, who do we have here? Um, I, I, uh, there are too many uh, elements and, and players involved, but I quickly wanted to uh, divide the oppressive forces and corporations involved in this invasive and toxic Dakota Access Pipeline. So to start, on the, on the left we see CEO uh, uh, Warren, uh, Warren Kelsey, um, he's been uh, more and more in the news as he has some strong ties to the upper right corner, Donald Trump, who um, has minor holdings in the uh, um, energy transfer and uh, might have some, uh, uh, what do you call it, personal interest. Next to him we see uh, Bob Owens from uh, Sunoco and the CEO from Enbridge. Can we still see? Yeah, there we see it. Um, then followed uh, one line over. The mercenaries pay to get uh, dirtier than regular police would get. Cheating is, uh, is winning. Setting dogs on is fair play. And uh, yeah, these are, these are all backed up by um, the men, like uh, the, the sheriff. He's been uh, supporting all this uh, yeah, police violence all along. And the, the, especially the use of private mercenaries is something uh, America has a long history in. <laughs> um, we'll see that later. So what else do we got? So uh, uh, right now there's a petition to fire uh, Kirk Meyer, the, the sheriff. And uh, it already has over um, 111,000 people voting for his removal. And I, I think that's another uh, struggle that's really worthwhile of removing uh, corruptive forces out of office. And if we get started, I think we have a lot of groundwork to do. Up next, uh, we have Governor Dapple. PYT the, the has, uh, has, yeah, has named him Governor Dapple. Uh, PYT is the Young Turks. And uh, he, when the Dakota
Dakota Access Pipeline was announced, um, he, Jack Dalrymple, had just urged industry and government officials to build more pipelines to keep pace with the state's oil production, which is only second to uh, the oil production in Texas. So right off the bat, um, the, the water protectors weren't just uh, up against one company, not just up against the police, but higher up levels of governors, uh, presidents, and um, um, Boas, the US district judge, has also um, been in court saying that it wasn't really obvious that the water protector protectors would suffer any damage because of this uh, pipeline. And he is, by the way, appointed by Obama, this Boas Berg, so people still have illusions about Obama. And then finally, you have the, the banks, the banks uh, putting in more than $3.8 billion uh, into this pipeline. And uh, if we follow the money, we also get back to the Dutch banks, uh, ABN, IAG, um, and I think this is also where some of our solidarity work lies, both changing banks, but also putting really um, some, some uh, pressure on the banks, because it's not just the, the pipeline. Uh, IAG has also recently uh, been reported on that they have over a billion of funding in, uh, in nuclear arms uh, producers. So these are really destructive forces and like, yeah, this struggle is really a struggle for life against the politics of death. In Bolivia, they often talk about we have a choice. Uh, either we, we fight for life or we will die under capitalism because it's the politics of death. So yeah, and, and with these uh, players, you also have some, some icons or some uh, uh, one thing that should be noted more than ever is spied upon. This was really a drone uh, a battlefield. Uh, both the, the drones of the water protectors trying to scout and, and be one with the territory, know where the threats were coming from, but also definitely by the police and uh, drones that were used by the water protectors were also taken out of the sky. It was a, a sky battle as much as a water battle and a land battle. Uh, Sunoco in the left corner has a track record of over 200 spills in the last few years. So anybody who will call you a concerned citizen, when you talk about um, being against Apple, you should say, no, 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 no. I'm not concerned, I'm informed. This is a disaster. Uh, up next, when we look at the, the players, uh, the water protectors, we see a whole other type of image. Uh, one thing that strikes me uh, from the get-go is that this is a struggle really um, carried by strong women, by strong native women, as well as uh, support from strong filmmakers and social justice journalists. Besides the strong women taking the lead, we also see that strong women also are the ones who catch the bullets. Sophia Wilansky, 21 years old, lost her arm uh, and may face the amputation of her arm. Vanessa Dundon, she lost her eyesight and uh, when rubber bullets uh, are continuously fired on water protectors that are holding a prayer circle or having a peaceful direct action. One should know that rubber bullets are not toy bullets. They are actually called lesser lethal uh, weapons. So yeah. The score, I don't know how your guys are keeping score, but for me it was impossible. I wanted to first put it all in the timeline and then pick it all out, and I was like, okay, one final thing, I, I, this is just for, for from this year, and I wanted to note one little blob thingy, which is at the end, where we're now, is that already from the get-go, they started, of course, without the consent of the Sioux Nation, but there was an expiring date to their contract, and that is January in 2017. So already when all this protest was starting taking to take shape and, and more thousands and thousands came to the camp and the solidarity grew, um, the, the tactics, the violence of, of the corporate state uh, also intensified because if uh, the pipeline uh, isn't completed before January, there's actually a big chance that a lot of people will drop out because the the financing isn't really uh, like uh, 
profitable. Profitable, thank you. Yeah, because the, the, the oil uh, prices have actually gone down. Uh, this was right away for, for export purposes and a lot of things have changed since 2014. So uh, having this victory right before January and this pipeline not being completed is actually something we should seriously, seriously celebrate. Yeah, I'm gonna skip some parts because I have so much to say. I'm gonna get back into the uh, history. Uh, one thing I do want to add is that one of my heroes of reporting on the struggle was uh, Jordan Sheraton uh, from the Young Turks and he said, this was never just about water. Native Americans have been oppressed for centuries. That's the story of America. I think a lot of us woke up to that. And you are taught this in elementary school, but you don't exactly carry it with you. So here we have water protecting uh, colonization, police brutality, racism, climate justice activism, fighting unjust laws that normalize dispossession, fighting violent sexism, which we come to later, and there are also bridges to be made with the fight for uh, justice in Palestine, as we see the dirty player G4, G4 app, I don't know how should say that, um, or G4 app. Um, world's largest security firm, um, after years and years of BDS campaigning, they, they pledged that they would drop out of Israel in 2016. I don't know if anybody has the update on that, but it's a dirty player uh, in the world, and, and yeah, they call themselves security. So, it's time to look at four challenges indigenous people have faced ever since the beginning of colonization. Um, am I, am I, by the way, am I going right in speed? Am I talking too fast? Am I too slow? Sure. Temperature check? Okay. Yeah. Water slide. So it's important uh, to note that the type of war waged on Indians by settlers it is what we now call unlimited war, uh, whose purpose is to destroy the will of the enemy to resist employing any means necessary, but mainly attacking civilians and their support systems, such as food supply. Today, this is called special operations or low intensity conflict. That kind of warfare was first used against indigenous communities by colonial militias in Virginia and Massachusetts. So these irregular forces made up for uh, settlers, sought to disrupt every aspect of resistance, as well as to obtain intelligence through scouting and taking prisoners. So they did by destroying the land, the people, the water, indigenous villages and fields, and intimidating and slaughtering enemy non-combatants. Some Indian nations were committed to prolonged attempts of sustaining peace, uh, were still met with threats to kill their women and their children if they didn't feed or clothe the settlers. And one of the earliest examples is Jamestown. Um, the Vahunsonakok, the leader of the Confederacy, spoke uh, to the invaders. And I always find this quite emotional when I hear the language, which is such an open, uh, open communication. And think to myself how people are capable of again and again um, just uh, applying such brute um, military slaughter. Uh, so he says, why should you take by force that from us which you can have by love? Why should you destroy us who have provided you with food? What can you get by war? What is the cause of your jealousy? You see us unarmed and willing to supply your wants. If you will come in a friendly manner and not with swords and guns as to invade us. However, uh, the military uh, uh, man Smith uh, carried out his uh, war against the Powhatans and started in 1609 and that continued uh, the Indian War was pretty much from that time till uh, the end of the 19th century. So these are like centuries of continuous war. Um, and when all set was said 
said and done, the U.S. found itself never quenching its thirst in warfare, and a nasty habit is still plaguing this world today. Whenever um, the U.S. goes to war today, it still talks of enemy territory as inland, which is short for Indian land. It still plays out Indian wars. If it goes to um, um, Afghanistan, if it goes to Iraq, uh, they're still playing out the same narrative. And they even go so far as to um, the operation in which bin Laden was uh, captured. They called it Operation Geronimo. And Geronimo is known to be the last and biggest Apache leader to fight the Americans in the end of the 19th century. So to compare capturing bin Laden and playing cowboy and Indian and um, destroying one of the most beautiful, powerful men who was in almost 70 when he was last captured and still kept in prison for the longest time because they didn't uphold their peace that they promised. And uh, he died an old man in prison. So as uh, Robert B. Kaplan notes in his book, Imperial Grunts, he heard uh, from US grunts, welcome to Indian country was the refrain from troops from Colombia, Philippines, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Um, in recent years, we saw U.S. Attorney General Yu employ a legal category, homo sacer. I don't know, did anybody of you ever hear of homo sacer? Okay, but you probably heard of um, um, unlawful combatants. So this pretty much means that um, the U.S. can do whatever the fuck they want with you if you're in Guantanamo Bay or one of their other torture facilities. So this is based on actually a court decision once made uh, in an Indian war. It, a homo sacer means a person banned from society. So this is a category of unlawful combatants that had no human rights and could be tortured and disappear. Um, so you, uh, in these, this day and age, defends this practice by a legal analogy with the U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1873 on the motto of Indian prisoners. So according to this line of thinking, anyone who could be defined as Indian could be tortured and killed legally because they are a homo sacer, a person banned from society. And this is in the 21st century. So we get to see a little bit of the nature of the US, which we are quick to understand as a brand that it's kind of violent and racist and uh, imperial and badass. But that's the from side. And it's kind of interesting when you look at really the historical narrative and, and see that the people that have been fighting the settler colony for centuries have learned some lessons, because this was a genocide. And it, in a genocide, it doesn't really help for you to say, I'm gonna go on a hunger strike. It's, I think Noam Chomsky says something about this. It makes no sense to go on a hunger strike if you're in a concentration camp. If the enemy wants to destroy you, you gotta have some other tactics of asymmetrical struggles, guerrilla struggles. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. This was a quote by Sheridan when a, a, a good Indian proposed himself and said, I'm a good Indian, you know, I come here in peace. He said, the only Indian is a, is a dead Indian. Good Indian is a dead Indian. So that was uh, the first lesson we can learn is when your enemy really wants to kill you, when their politics is the politics of death, it is not enough to raise consciousness. You have to raise resistance. And that's a physical material struggle. So then we go on to the next one. Here on the left, we see this Mr. Sheridan. Uh, in the middle, we see uh, a pile of bones, which is between 1900 and 1920. These are millions and millions of bison. One of the tactics when U.S. couldn't uh, uh, get uh, Indian nations that knew the territory, that were the territory, uh, couldn't get them to submit, one of the tactics was just kill millions and millions of bison kill the food stock, burn the corn crop, and starve them to death. Uh, another thing you see on the right is the scalping. Uh, this is uh, a practice I would like to get onto later in the discussion um, of, of racism and anti-racism uh, uh, 
getting rid of racist expressions in society. Uh, the sculpting of um, Indians, when you have a sculpt body, from ear to ear, you could get bounty for it, you could get money for it. And uh, the leftover body would be called red skin because the head is cut open and it has red blood. So now today we see a lot of uh, sports uh, games and they are called red skin. And uh, they have iconic, uh, like, like black painting, only with India. So it's something in the US, I think, when they look at the Netherlands and how ridiculous our first speed is, they haven't really internalized the fact that their red face, uh, red skinning <laughs> is um, in the same bracket of um, racism and colonial. So the second big lesson is kill the Indian, save the man. After continuous genocide, uh, a new era began. There was a Mr. Pratt and he proposed like, hey you guys, we can actually have the white man's burden to educate these, these savages, these Indians. If we only kill the children, if we get the children while they're young, we put them in boarding schools, which ended up looking a lot like concentration camps and well, a lower degree of survival rate than uh, Dachau or Buchen, Buchen. Yeah, I know, I heard you. I'm just giving you credit for, for, for knowing your shit. Um, I'm freestyling here, so. Uh, but yeah, so these boarding schools were um, in the last century, the end of the 19th century to the end of the 20th century, continuous children were taken away from their communities. And so here we see kids get into these boarding schools, they are forbidden to speak their language. If they speak their language, they don't get any food, um, they have to wash their, wash their mouth with soap, sometimes to punish uh, the kids for speaking their language by sticking needles in their tongue. Kids, it was a regular practice to uh, beat and rape kids, both boys and girls, and the suicide rate was so high, um, they're everywhere around all these boarding schools, uh, cemeteries, because sometimes there would be a time where 73 kids would go into these schools and only 26 kids would survive. So. Kill the Indian, save the man. Uh, the, the great man behind this idea was Mr. Pratt. Uh, here you see some of these uh, kids. And what you see here is that it isn't enough to just survive physically and wage resistance. This is an attack on the psyche. This is an attack on the spiritual being, of your sense of self, your sense of belonging. And so actually what happened is um, if people would resist and not give up their, their kids, like uh, some of the Hopis did, they would spend years in military prison on Alcatraz for the offense of refusing to surrender their kids. And the idea was kind of to create a, a, a tabula rasa, which uh, is like erasing the soul, the narrative, the culture, the language, and having a blank sheet to fill with obedience and to get in line as an alienated body that can fulfill wage labor. Uh, what you see, to the next slide, Yep, yep. Um, you see these kind of work camps, and they were really, really profitable. Um, you could get all the kids to work, and you didn't have to pay them anything, and the schools made a lot of money out of it. Somewhere in this book, Kill the Indian, Save the Man, there are all the numbers of all these, uh, all, all the output. So you really see the, the changing of ideas, like, okay, so we can kill all the bodies, or we can create uh, a, a wage slave in which if, if they're dependent enough in, in their present relationship, we can actually profit from their living bodies. So the larger goal was not to control, not only to control native people, but to consensually legal theft of their properties. And I think here is a, an interesting one today still because we are all kind of learned to be self-sabotaging ourselves in society a lot of the time. We know a lot of shit is wrong. We know that it's kind of weird that there are 62 people in the world that have uh, as, as much money and as much stuff as 3.5 billion, like half the planet. We know that's fundamentally wrong, but we are so 
taught not to resist. And I think the, the boarding schools here are really um, a practice of breaking spirits, a practice of, uh, uh, Naomi Klein wrote a book about uh, shock therapy. I think this is, you know, like one of the early developments of uh, really attacking the soul and, and, and creating soul wounds. So the great task of any oppressive empire is to make the oppressed accomplices groomed into self-sabotage by fear and by forgetting alternatives. This is something highly relevant for today's activism in any branch where activists find themselves confused with parts of the puzzle of injustice. Blinded by a misty, misty something of greater sim systematic political injustice that seems slightly out of reach in language and in factual and emotional understanding to truly know how to break down the walls of tyranny. So one of the things is that kids, you know, we all get, our history in school is so tainted. I think we know that in, in the Netherlands we don't learn anything about what the Netherlands did in Indonesia or what the Netherlands did in the Surinams or any of that shit. I don't know if you, you had that in high school, I didn't. So it, it really requires constant effort of us um, unforgetting because we're taught to forget all the time and these boarding schools were really uh, waged in this idea. So the lesson from this peri period of time I think is really to not divorce um, material activism, which had to be really strong, guerrilla, warfare, everything, with spiritual resistance, with uh, maintaining a culture, maintaining a narrative. Without a narrative, helplessness has a stronger hold on you. This education uh, for extinction also uh, made it possible for a third thing to appear. Um, it's the third challenge, which is called first thing and last thing. This is a bigger cultural phenomena. So I, I use this example to exemplify that. Um, and Google says, when did the last Native Americans surrender? Uh, this date in Native history on September 4, 1886. So what you see here is that there's a narrative that the last Native Americans surrendered in 1886 which is a, a long time ago. That's the last of the resistance, the last of the Indian War. We have movies and books called The Last of the Mohicans. Everything that's Indian is the last, the last man standing. Whereas with the white man, it's the first university, it's the first train station, it's the first, and they claim modernity. They actually eliminate Indians from modernity. Um, so if you want to fight for indigenous justice, then you're just talking about the past because that's in the past, first thing and last thing. It's a, it's a propaganda, propaganda tool that is uh, used in Google, it's used in school box. I find this very funny actually because the last Native Americans, it's like, hello, they're talking about Apaches, they're talking about Geronimo, about one war. But just in 1917, there was the, the, the Green Rebellion. I don't know if anybody heard of that, but that's where uh, a lot of Native Indians, um, uh, uh, farmers, uh, unions, uh, uh, black people who were oppressed, all rose together in a re big rebellion. That was because of the rich man's war in the First World War. In the 30s, there was a lot of resistance. In the 60s, there was a lot of resistance. In the 70s, you had uh, Wounded Knee. It just keeps on going, but it's being written out of history. So this is a, an interesting book to read on that, First Thing and Last Thing. And I think uh, the general lesson or the challenge and the thing and thing, the third challenge requires a resistance waged in public culture, one of recollection, of unforgetting, and understanding historical problems in a contemporary text context. Especially this waged in public, Tomorrow we have an action uh, in front of ING, um, and we talked a lot about this as water protectors here in the Netherlands. Like when we have a ceremony, what what should it be about, or what are we doing there in our ceremony? And one thing we we really felt was that what's so beautiful about the water protectors is that you feel their raw emotion. You feel um, they're so vulnerable. They have their arms open all the time. They to the Army US Corps to say, have you ever been raped? And the guy says, no. And she says, I have. And she has tears in her eyes. And she says, and when you come to my land and you build this thing, it feels like you are invading me. And I'm watching these videos and the tears are just coming down my face because it's so disarming. It's emotion. 
and they're breathing in public. And we said, okay, so if we do ceremonies in the Netherlands, if we go to ING, we are, we are not there as a, as a native Sioux. We are there as, as Dutch people, but Dutch people have grieving too. We have, and we tend to grieve in private uh, because emotions have kind of been swept away from the left. If you're sad, then you're weak. If you're angry, then you're an angry activist. So what are you supposed to do? Give all the emotions to the right wing and let them hate on you? It's like, no, 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 no. So we need to <laughs> reclaim public space so we can grieve in public, we can feel in public, we can be angry in public. The, the collective process of unforgetting and realizing that justice work is also yeah, a, a, a work of remembering that we are taught to forget. Finally, I'm gonna open the floor soon. <laughs> the Sioux, okay, so this was a little bit of a bigger story of the whole US, couldn't resist to tell this bigger story because I think it's really relevant. But in the case of the water protectors, we are particularly talking about a nation that was never forced into submission by the US military. They remained a, a guerrilla party, the Dakota, um, throughout the, the 80s and the 90s of the 19th century. And the only way that they got into the fold of uh, capitalism is that at some point uh, they re relied on trade. They relied on the s trading the skins because of all their bison being killed and their food stock was eliminated. They got into the fold by uh, dependency of merchandise. But they, rem uh, they still have their fighting spirit. And if you see here, this is the, the timeline of, uh, a little bit of the timeline of conquest. You see what is, what's striking to me is that, you see 1820s, you still see the United States is pretty small. It's not even half of what it is today. If you look here um, uh, at the end of the 19th century, all of this here is still not conquered land. The, the light green is not conquered, only the, the dark green. So this is where North and South Dakota is. Like up until the end of the 19th century, this was their land, the Dakota Nation. So here you see a story of destruction of the land and how it came, it first came the, the the rangers, uh, they cleared the land that was ethnic cleansing, then you got in the, um, the, the trade posts, and more and more uh, settlers came in. And if you look at that map of escalation of clearing the land, and with it came getting in there for, for, for gold, getting in there for uh, extractive uh, resources, uh, the minerals, we see a striking resemblance with the disappearing of Palestine. Um, so when we look at a, a capture like the disappearing of Palestine, one should ask, people didn't really disappear, they got colonized, it's a different thing. I'm, I'm very happy that today I get to talk about colonization because I, was, I just came back from a Czech Republic and I was in the train with an American and he thought of himself as a very much a progressive and he was Vermont from Vermont and he was gonna vote for Hillary and all this stuff. And um, then I mentioned to him that he was living in a settler colony and he just freaked out. It was a night train, it was very quiet, it was all very chill chill, it was dark, no light. But he freaked out, it's just not acceptable to, to say to an American that he's living in a settler colony. I mean, he may not have chosen it, he was born in it, he didn't make it, but that's the, the fact. And I think from the water protectors, we are reclaiming a narrative of this is stolen land. And when you oppress us with, with Thanksgiving and arrest people for trespassing on their own land, we are pointing out that irony. We are making the story whole again.